So let's get started. We'll start with disease severity. Most infected individuals, about 80% of them, will have a mild illness, but about 15% will require hospitalization, and about 5% will need intensive care in the hospital. In contrast, only about 1% of those who have flu usually require hospitalization. So COVID-19 is a much more severe disease compared to the flu. Adults, especially those that have comorbidities and those who are over the age of 65, are at higher risk from severe disease and death. Those with comorbidities have a mortality rate of about 10%, and those over the age of 70 have a mortality rate between 8 and 15%. In contrast, the mortality rate for those without comorbidities or those who are under the age of 65 is less than 1%. Children in general tend to have much more mild disease compared to adults. Fewer than 1% of infected children usually require hospitalization. But it's also important to note that our mortality rates are greatly affected by the healthcare surge capacity within a community. Anytime a healthcare system's capacity is exceeded by infected individuals who require medical care, the mortality rate increases. So let's talk about occupational exposure risk. The CDC divides the occupational risk of COVID-19 into four categories, from very high risk businesses to lower risk businesses. Hospitals and healthcare facilities pose the highest occupational risk of exposure to employees, primarily because healthcare staff have prolonged close contact with infected individuals and because they perform infectious aerosolizing procedures and other medical procedures that put healthcare personnel at risk from exposure. Non-healthcare businesses have a medium to low risk of occupational exposure to COVID-19, depending on the type of business and the type of interactions that occur between employees and members of the general public, or even between coworkers. In general, non-healthcare businesses do not involve prolonged close contact between individuals that's required for COVID-19 to spread. Healthcare personnel are often at disproportionately higher risk of infection during an outbreak of an emerging infectious disease compared to those who do not work in healthcare. So for example, during the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak in 2003, almost a quarter of all infected individuals were healthcare personnel, and that disease was quite severe. It had a 10% mortality rate. This was absolutely devastating to healthcare and to healthcare personnel as a whole. Healthcare personnel were also found to be disproportionately affected during the Ebola crisis in 2014 to 2016 and the MERS-CoV outbreak in 2013. During the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare personnel were found to be at extremely high risk of illness early on during the pandemic. This was primarily due to our early belief that this was only a zoonotic illness, meaning that we thought the illness was caused by exposure to animals. We did not know at that time that there was also human to human spread until healthcare personnel began becoming ill after providing care to patients in hospitals in Wuhan, China. This is because isolation precautions and personal protective equipment or PPE were not being used early on to provide care to those patients. After we figured out that this was a communicable disease, we began using isolation precautions and PPE and occupational disease decreased significantly. Healthcare worker infections were then primarily tied to household or community exposures rather than occupational exposures. The exception to this has been aerosolizing procedures. Healthcare workers have been found to be at very high risk of exposure and illness if they're involved in an aerosolizing procedure on a COVID-19 infected patient if they were not wearing an N95 respirator or comparable respiratory protection. In September of 2020, the CDC published data on about 100,000 healthcare workers who were infected with COVID-19 between February 12th and July 16th. Most infected healthcare workers, about 92%, had mild illness and did not require hospitalization. However, some healthcare workers did have severe illness that required hospitalization, and 641 infected healthcare workers in that study had died from COVID-19. That's a 1% mortality rate. 92% of fatal healthcare worker cases were among healthcare personnel that had an underlying medical condition. Those who were older, male, Asian, or Black were more likely to die of COVID-19 compared to other healthcare workers. These health differences we are seeing between racial and ethnic groups are similar to what is happening across the general population. Systemic health and social inequities 
put these individuals at increased risk of getting COVID-19 or from experiencing severe illness. Nurses were the most frequently reported healthcare worker group or type infected in this study. 30% of the infected healthcare workers were nurses. This is a disproportionate percentage of infections because nurses account for only about 15% of the total U.S. healthcare professionals. Nurses working in nursing and residential care facilities were more likely than nurses in other settings to be infected. This is related to multiple challenges identified in long-term care settings during the pandemic, including inadequate staffing and PPE and insufficient training in infection prevention. As the pandemic continues, it's essential that nurses and other healthcare personnel have access to adequate PPE in the workplace as one way of mitigating systemic inequalities in COVID-19 risk across populations and across healthcare settings. Now, there is one huge caveat to this data on healthcare worker COVID-19 infections. The report did not specify whether healthcare workers were infected through occupational or community exposure. SARS-CoV-2 is a very contagious virus, and no one is believed to have inherent immunity to it. Therefore, experts estimate that between 30 and 40 percent of all individuals will be infected with COVID-19 before the pandemic ends. In addition, we have new evidence that individuals can be infected with different strains of COVID-19, meaning that you can be reinfected. As of this webinar recording, evidence of reinfection has been a very rare event, but this could become more common the longer the pandemic lasts as individuals are exposed to multiple strains of SARS-CoV-2. So exactly how contagious is SARS-CoV-2? Well, we describe the contagiousness of a disease by using a term called the r naught or basic reproduction rate. The r naught for COVID-19 is believed to be between 2.2 and 3.1, meaning that each infected individual is going to infect on average between two and three other people. Anytime the r naught for a disease is above one, an outbreak is likely to occur. When the r naught for a disease is above 1.5, a pandemic is likely. One of the goals of public health safeguards and infection prevention interventions is to reduce the r naught to less than one. That means that disease spread is not happening on a widespread basis. In addition to having a high r naught, one of the primary reasons why COVID-19 is spreading so easily and quickly in communities is that 30 to 40% of all infected individuals are either asymptomatic or presymptomatic. This means that they have no symptoms, but they are still shedding sufficient virus to be contagious. It's very difficult to control disease spread when contagious individuals are not showing symptoms. It is far easier to identify infected individuals when they have symptoms, so you can quickly isolate them and prevent disease transmission. Availability of PPE is vital during the COVID-19 pandemic to protect healthcare staff from exposure. Staff need to have access to the correct PPE and they need to know how to use it appropriately. Improper use of PPE both at work and while you're in the community can put you at risk from exposure and illness. For example, masks and respirators should always be removed from the straps at the back of the head or by the ear loops rather than from the front that will protect the wearer from accidentally touching their nose or their mouth while they're removing their mask or the respirator and accidentally infecting themselves. The front of the mask or respirator is the most contaminated part. If you do accidentally touch the front of your mask or respirator, make sure to perform hand hygiene before touching your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. Incorrect removal of respirators was believed to be a primary factor in the high rate of healthcare worker occupational illness during SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003. At one point, almost a third of all cases of SARS-CoV-1 were healthcare personnel. Once our practices changed to remove the respirator from the straps instead of the front, occupational illness dropped significantly. We are also seeing a relationship between PPE use and COVID-19 infections. A prevalent study was conducted with healthcare personnel between April 3rd and June 19th, 2020, examining the level of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies present. Antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 are an indicator of likely past infection. The study found two factors that are potentially associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection among healthcare personnel, PPE shortages and interacting with patients without wearing a mask or respirator. The prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies was lower among healthcare personnel 
who reported that they always wear a mask or respirator while providing care to patients, compared to those who did not always wear a mask or respirator. Universal masking has been associated with a significantly lower rate of infection among healthcare personnel. If you do become ill during the pandemic, it's critical that you not report to work. Infected healthcare personnel can inadvertently infect their patients or coworkers. For example, in Taiwan during the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak in 2003, a single infected hospital employee continued working while experiencing very mild symptoms of SARS-CoV-1. He reported that he felt as though he had a mild cold. He didn't even have a fever. And he only worked a single 12-hour shift while he had those symptoms. But epidemiological data indicates that he was linked to 137 secondary cases, 45 of whom were other healthcare workers. If you work in healthcare administration, it's critical that your facility has a flexible, non-punitive sick leave policy available for your healthcare personnel. That will ensure that healthcare workers are able to take time off work when they're ill and not accidentally contribute to this pandemic. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, infection prevention interventions have been essential to preventing occupational exposure and disease spread. As I mentioned earlier, before we knew that this disease was communicable, there was a very high risk of occupational exposure and illness because isolation precautions and PPE were not used. Currently, healthcare workers do remain at risk from COVID-19 if they don't have access to or do not wear the correct PPE when providing care to COVID-19 patients. Perhaps the most critical infection prevention measure to control the pandemic is to quickly identify infected individuals and isolate them. Research indicates that rapid isolation is the most important intervention to control outbreaks when the disease has an r naught between one and five. And as I mentioned earlier, COVID-19's r naught are not is between two and three.